Uh, warm welcome to Lost for Words, a podcast exploring the opinions, glories and the most interesting stories of guests. I am your host Jason and in the run up to the Scottish Parliament election, this episode is a politics special featuring the Glasgow East MP David London from the Scottish National Party. David has been the MP since 2017 when he was elected with a majority of just 75 before increasing this to over 5,000 in 2019. He speaks to me about his life story before politics, life in politics, as well as what he likes to do when not at Westminster. This episode is the SNP election special. However, David is down to earth when talking about all subjects and is clearly an excellent speaker. Here, he delivers his pitch for the SNP vote at the ballot box. There's another election special with the Conservative councillor Philip Charles. I would encourage you to give that a listen to just for a bit of balance. I hope you enjoy listening to this episode and I will speak to you at the other side. A quick housekeeping note before we get started. Please leave a rating or a review wherever you get your podcasts, whether that be Apple, Google, Spotify, Podbean or any other platform. It's the best way the podcast can grow and better content can be produced for you, the listener. It's your listening experience that matters the most. But enough from me, now on to today's episode of Lost for Words. Uh, hi David, how are you doing? Very well Jason, really looking forward to being on your Lost for Words podcast, so let's dive in. Talk to me about your beginnings then David, where did you go to school and what was it like growing up? Went to Mellencroft Primary School and in many respects I always kind of think that you know, my my background, my upbringing is probably not the typical one for somebody in the House of Commons. You know, I, I say I grew up in a council house with kind of like single glazing windows and damp in, in the bedroom, um, single parent households, left school at 16, um, did all the, the kind of stuff that teenagers normally do. Um, so my, my, my upbringing was, was one that would be pretty typical of, of most of my constituents. I think that's probably a good thing because it means that I'm more representative of the area that I represent. Um, but yeah, a fairly, fairly normal upbringing for me. And when you left school at 16, what did you then immediately go and do? Yeah, so I, I mean, certainly politics was, was never something that I intended to do. Um, I always say that politics is a bit like quicksand. The more you fight it, the more you get sucked into it. But um, I think it'd be fair to say that, that high school for me, you know, I, I enjoyed high school. Um, I was always probably what you would consider a bit of an in-betweener, so I wasn't a geek, I wasn't an ed. Um, would kind of like go between, um, so very much an in-betweener, but um, performed academically okay at high school, um, but decided quite early on that, you know, as soon as I could leave, i.e. fourth year, then I would do that. So I left school at 16 and my intention had been to, to join the police. I wanted to go into the police cadets. Um and so I, I applied and, and, and went to, to do the, the interview. Um but before I did the interview I, I had to, to go and do what's called the standard entrance test. Um and just at that point, not long before that, my, my dad had been in prison for attempted murder. So I'd been estranged from my dad for a number of years. Um but I mean clearly when you're applying to the police, you've got to do a kind of full disclosure. So I arrived that night to do my, my standard entrance test in Jackton. Um, and I was just really nervous about it because the I think it was the chief inspector at the time had said, right, you know, you, you'll do this test and then after it, if there's anything that you need to tell us, um, then you, you can tell us after it. So I spent the whole, so the, 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 the test comprises it in parts, so there's English, maths and information handling. And I just spent the whole time sitting in that, that hall doing the test and thinking to myself, how on earth did I turn around and tell the cops that my dad's just been put away in the clink for attempted murder? And if it was fine after they want a police officer with that. So it would be fair to say that my, my mind was elsewhere during the test. But lo and behold, I get I think it full marks in English, did really well in maths, but I failed my information handling part of the test by half a mark. And that was it. That was the end of my journey um, for applying to get into the police. Um, so I got the letter through from what was at the time Strathclyde by police saying that you know I hadn't had they passed the standard entrance test. And by this point, I'd already given notice to, to Bannerman High School, which is my local high school, um, that I was planning to leave. Um, and I think the sensible thing, Jason, would probably have been for me to say, right, okay, I don't have a plan about where I'm going to go, <laughs> um, so I'm going to go back and do fifth year. But um, yeah. I've always been quite kind of strong-headed. So I decided, no, no, I, I'm definitely, I'm going to leave I'm going to leave high school when I'm, when I'm 16. with no plan of where I was going. 
so anyway, I, I was I, I'm still you know an Airdrie supporter, season ticket holder, and one of the ladies in my supporters bus um, worked at Access Loans and Mortgages in Glasgow City Centre. And she said to me, "Look, I can get you a job working in Access Loans and Mortgages." So I, I trotted off um, from high school at the end of that year to go and work at Access um, on a salary of six thousand pounds a year um, as a, a junior member of the underwriting department and I remember thinking your six grand a year was a huge amount of money because <laughs> um, I was a 16 year old and yeah to be fair I'll, I'll be completely honest I was a 16 year old who was who was underage drinking and buying things at Frosty Jacks um, so so six thousand pounds a year was going to keep me going and two pound fifty bottles of Frosty Jacks um, mm-hmm. but I quickly realized after a few months uh, at Access Loans and Mortgages that you know this probably wasn't ideal to have left school with only kind of basic qualifications um, and there was no kind of route map or, or career progression. Um, so I applied for an apprenticeship to Glasgow City Council. Um, and, and fair play to them, you know, credit where credit's due. Um, the the council at that time was run by the Labour Party. Um, so not not my political flavour, um, but I had a big, big commitment to apprenticeships. Um, it was actually Stephen Purcell, who was the council leader at the time. Um, so I applied for an apprenticeship to Glasgow City Council, got accepted onto that. And went and did my apprenticeship in business administration. So I was placed with Glasgow Credit Union. Um, so I finished my apprenticeship there. And then by election come up in the of Glasgow in 2008. And against all the odds, we won the by election. I got the opportunity to go and work for the local MP as a caseworker. Um, and I've pretty much been in politics ever since 2008 in different capacities. When I worked in, worked in the House of Commons as a parliamentary assistant, worked in the European Parliament, worked in Scottish Parliament. So I've done all three parliaments. And then obviously in 2017, I got elected in my own right. So that, that was kind of my leaving school and going into the world of work. Um, and in many respects, I kind of feel a wee bit robbed. I, you know, because I went into politics so young, um, it, it, it certainly, a, you know, career politics so young, I feel like I've missed out in, in quite a fair bit of the world of work. So it's probably for that reason that you know I've always been quite open about the fact that I don't intend to spend the rest of my life as a politician. This is very much a short term thing. I mean, by my very nature, I'm an SNP MP. My job is to try and make myself unemployed. Um, but I don't intend to, to, for example, go off to the Scottish Parliament and become a government minister and all that. That is definitely not part of my plan. I'd quite like to go back to, to working maybe at a credit union or something like that. Some, something that I really enjoy doing. So what age were you when the 2008 Glasgow East by-election? So I was 18 years old um, and I, I remember the by-election was called and so so Labour were defending the by-election with a 13,500 majority or something like that. So I mean, it, it should have been an absolute stick on for, for winning the seat. Um, but I was the local SNP organiser back then um, and I thought, you know what, I'd, I'd really like to be involved in a by-election in my own patch. So I remember getting at my work at the credit union and saying to them, this by-election's been called, I want to take three weeks unpaid leave from my job. Um, I remember having to lie to my mum. Mum said, how did you get three weeks off work? And I said, oh, I three weeks off work. I explained until I'd taken it as unpaid leave. Um, but I mean, I threw everything at that by-election. Um, worked really long hours um, just as a volunteer. Um, and miraculously, and it, it was a miracle, um, we, we won the by-election by 365 votes. And so my, my SNP colleague, John Mason, won the seat. Um, and so the opportunity, I mean, he obviously had to set up an office in, in Shettleston. Um, and because I had been the organiser, I knew the constituency really well. I knew a lot of the issues in the constituency. Um, so I got I the opportunity. I mean, he really took a punt on me um, to, to go and be a caseworker. Um, so a lot of it I was dealing with, you know, people coming out of the office complaining about potholes, pensions, benefits, the health service. Um, and I, I took that job and, and really, um, really ran with it. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed it as well. Um, sadly, it all came to an end in 2010 because, as is often the case with by-election winners, you don't tend to hold your seat at the subsequent general election. And then at that stage, I went off to work for, for other politicians, both in, in Holyrood and in Westminster. But that was very much me getting my foot on the ladder for the first time um, of politics. Uh, but I, I owe an, an enormous debt of gratitude to John for that, no, no doubt, because he, he did take a chance on me. So what was the process of going from there to then being nominated to stand in 2017? Yeah, so in the nine years in between, what did you do? Well, I mean, so, so there's obviously there's a big gap in between that. Um, so that was me largely working for other politicians. Um, and, you know, I, I've, I was always kind of much more of a kind of backroom guy. Um, I mentioned, obviously, I had been an organiser for the SNP, so kind of 
pulling together a lot of the kind of campaigns locally, making sure we were getting our leaflets out, that we had activists to, to kind of deliver the campaign. Um, and to be honest, Jason, I was probably quite happy being uh, a backroom guy. I had no aspiration to be a politician in my own right. Um, I was certainly well used to, to working for politicians, for, for briefing them, helping with their media and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I think some of it, if I'm being really, really brutally honest, I think some of it goes back to my kind of background in my upbringing is that I felt that, you know, and it's, it's totally wrong, I get that now, but certainly in my early 20s, I felt that as a young young guy from the East End with, with relatively few qualifications, single parent household, brought up in a council estate, um, probably a lack of confidence as well. I, pro- I felt that, you know, being an elected politician wasn't really my place, you know, that was a bit above my station. Um, and if I'm being, again, really honest, I think that I'd had the opportunity to work for lots of other politicians. And so in 2017, I had kind of decided that I wasn't any better than any of them, but I probably wasn't any worse. So I should have a crack at it myself. But there, there's a wee bit before that. So the, the, the referendum, Scottish Independence Referendum in 2014, I'd been a kind of campaign manager locally. Um, I put my heart and soul into to kind of try and to, to, to kind of get a yes vote, which we obviously got in the East End, but not, not countrywide. Um, so we lost the referendum, you know, it was a, it was a 55% no vote, um, and so Scotland did not clearly become independent. And at that stage, you know, I just felt like I'd been absolutely punched in the gut. Um, but I remember getting a phone call um, a couple of months after the, the referendum from, from somebody who's now a cabinet minister in the government saying to me, look, you know, there's a Westminster election next year. We think the SNP is going to do really well. We need to try and get candidates in place. Have you thought about standing for Glasgow East at the 2015 election? And I remember just laughing down the phone. I was like, absolutely no way. Um, because the, I, I would just be, I'd be ripped apart at the hustings. At this point, you know, obviously I'm a Christian as well. So you know, there, was, there was going to be lots of questions about the Christian faith. I didn't really fancy having to ask, answer questions to 80 people about why I believe in the virgin birth. Um, and also just, I, I was knackered from the, I was knackered from the, from the referendum. So I said no. Um, and so it's, it's quite well documented that, that somebody else went forward for selection and kind of won the selection process and ultimately won the seat. Um, and it would be fair to say, and, and we might come on to this in a wee minute, but um, it would be fair to say that from 2015 to 2017, I kind of looked on. Yes, at, yes, we'll come on to that. Least and and some, of the, some, of the issues of, some of the issues of controversy, and I thought to myself, maybe, maybe I should have put myself forward. Um, and so anyway, you know, events transpired that my predecessor wasn't allowed to stand again. And uh, again, I was encouraged by cabinet ministers to, to consider standing in the seat. And by this point, I thought, right, well, I'd got over some of my confidence issues. Um, and I thought, well, look, I, I've worked for so many politicians. They're all lovely folk, but they've, they're all flawed as well. And I, I eventually concluded that, you know, I wasn't any worse than any of them. So I should have a, a crack at the whip. Um, and there was only one place I would ever stand that I'm not, you know, in paper I might be considered as being a career politician because I've worked in politics, but I'm not the kind of guy that would have just been parachuted into any seat. The only place that I would want to represent is, you know, here, my, my home area. Um, and I still got one of the biggest kicks out of this job that I get is being able to walk from my flat in Carntine to Carntine Station on a Monday morning and for folk to be, oh, aye, that's the local MP and, you know, stopping and chatting to me about local stuff like that is by far one of the biggest privileges of this job is being able to represent your home community. Um, and so, so yeah, that, that's largely how I, how I ended up standing for the SNP. And, you know, the 2017 election was an absolute disaster for us. I mean, we lost 22 seats that night. I was the only new MP elected. I got in by the skin of my teeth. You know, my majority was only 75 uh, first election around. Um, Labour ran me really, really close. Um, so, you know, it was a difficult election for us, but ultimately I, I held on by my fingernails and, and, and held the seat for the party. And then, you know, the subsequent election in 2019, we, we did much better. But um, yeah, it, it, was a, it was a pretty bumpy experience. There's no doubt about so the that. 2017 one, when you were campaigning, I know the SNP as a party lost a few seats, but were you faced with the negative press that had come from your predecessor? Was that instantly against you or... Do you think it was more of an issue of the wider SNP decline? Which one was more of a factor in the 2017 razor thin majority? The the issue with my predecessor, in all honesty, did not come up a huge amount on the doorsteps. Um, because there was so much controversy, I think, around my predecessor. I mean, she 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 was 
she lost the whip from the SNP, I think after about, it was only about six or seven months or something like that, and she sat as an independent. Six months, and then she sat as independent, yeah. Yeah, so so she kind of like ceased to be an SNP MP from quite early on, and if I'm being really honest, the feedback that I had um, from quite a lot of people was that she when she lost the whip, she wasn't in the constituency as much, so I think she kind of faded from the consciousness of quite a lot of folk blocking. She was posted missing. Yeah, um, so she she kind of disappeared. Um, so by the time my election came around in 2017, her name wasn't really on people's lips. And I, I like, like you, I mean, I, I kind of thought that, oh, you know, this is going to come up every door I go to. Um, but in all honesty, I think maybe, I don't know, I must have chat hundreds, thousands of doors. Um, but in all honesty, her, her name didn't really come up more than about six or seven times. Um, and, and by that point as well, it was it was sub and it arguably still is. I mean, there, there's a possibility that it can back up in court. So mm-hmm. I've got to be careful what I say because it is subject to the judicial proceedings. Um, but it, it really didn't come up that much. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the wider campaign, and as I say, the SNP, there's no, there's no point in trying to kind of paint a, a pretty picture here. I mean, the, the SNP did really badly that election. We lost 22 seats, so we went down from... 56 I think seats um, and you know we, we had a, a shocker of an election now, some of that was because it was an election that wasn't part of the normal cycle so um, it was essentially kind of deemed as a bit of a midterm election Mid-terms election, midterm elections are, are generally quite difficult for um, they're quite difficult for, for incumbent governments um, but I also think there might be a messaging around about second referendum and stuff we, we weren't as clear on that um, it had just followed the, the, the Brexit election as well. So nationally, a lot of people's thought, thoughts were on Brexit. So it was quite difficult for us to get our message through. Um, but it was, there's no um, there's no bones about it. It was, it was a really tough election. And it became quite clear to me in the last 10 days that, you know, there was a, there was a real possibility that I wouldn't win my seat. Um, and I felt really bad about that because I was this new candidate standing and I didn't want to lose a seat for the SNP. I've been a party loyalist for 20 years and I joined the SNP in 2001. Um, so I, I was really mindful of the fact that I didn't want to let the party down. So I mean, I threw absolutely everything at it. I mean, I was still out chapping doors. I, mean, I would normally chap people's doors at 10 to 10 at night, but in Poland, yeah, I was still out <laughs> chapping doors at 10 to 10 at night. Um, and I remember some of my campaign actors thinking, you're absolutely mad to be doing this, you'll be fine. Um, but, you know, by kind of midnight when all the ballot boxes had been opened and they were starting to count the votes and we could see just how close it was. Um, I've got to say, I've never been so grateful to have been chatting doors till 10 to 10 at night because I, th- I think that pretty much got us over the line. Um, and then I certainly spent every kind of waking minute and I have done since 2017 working my seat and trying to be as available as possible to, to constituents. Um, and in that time, we've dealt with over 10,000 constituency cases. So um, I think part of that you know, was was a vindication of that in, in 2019 when I got re-elected with a, an increased share of the vote, increased number of votes, an increased number uh, or an increased majority. Yeah, so you did. You went from 75 majority to 5,000 plus majority. Did you get a better reception? So what had changed, do you think, on the doorstep? Um, well, there were a number of things. I, mean, I think we had a, a much clearer message in 2019. So um, I, I still remember I did huge amounts of media during the campaign. So I mean, our, our campaign message was something that was like burned into my memory because I was just repeating it ad nauseum on TV and on radio. Um, but I mean, our, our message in, in 2019 was to stop Brexit and to give you know Scotland the right to choose its own future. Um, and I think that message was, was much much clearer, much more crisp. Um, and so that it meant that the electorate knew what they were going to vote for. I mean, 2017, the story of my election and my constituency was basically, if you look at the numbers, 10,000 SNP voters just stayed at home. Um, whereas we, we managed to get, that, that, that's why I mentioned earlier on about having an increased number of votes. We managed, because of that, that clearer, more crisp message, to tell people why we wanted them to go out and vote. Um, so I think that was certainly a fact. And there was also, I, mean, I saw this, and I, I wouldn't say that it was thousands upon thousands of people, but certainly several hundred people kind of said to me, look, son, as they often do, look, son, I'm, I'm not an SNP voter, but, you know, you helped me with my housing issue or you helped me with my PIP claim or you got that pothole fixed 
for me. Um, so don't take this as a vote for the SNP. Don't take this as a vote for independence. But I'm going to go and vote to, to really like choose my local MP. A um, personal vote. So there, there was a bit of a personal vote there. I don't know what what element it was, but certainly if you look at the if you look at the results across Glasgow, if you look at the results across the city um, or, or across the country. I think most SNP MPs who were incumbent MPs, I think their kind of vote share went up by about four percent. Um, certainly, mine's went up; it was about eight or nine percent. Um, so there was something extra, something different that we'd done, um, and I think a lot of that comes down to local work. And at probably this juncture, I, I cannot let these kind of interviews go by without paying tribute to the guys that work in my office. I've got a really strong constituency team who just beaver away constantly dealing with countless inquiries coming in from constituents. And that is the probably the least sexy side of the job. And I think a lot of people see my work and see me standing up in the House of Commons in front of those green benches and giving speeches about universal credit and stuff. But actually, the most important part of my job is when somebody comes to a surgery and says, look, you know, I've got mental health issues. I've been for a work capability assessment and they've deemed me to be fit to work. But actually, I've got schizophrenia and I've assessed by somebody who is a physiotherapist and has no knowledge of mental health issues. Can you appeal this for me? We then go and appeal it and, and we get them uh, the, the result of their work capability assessment overturned. That's the real bread and butter work that members of parliament have to do. Um, and it's something that we've put a huge amount of effort into since 2017. Um, and I think we saw in 2019 at the election um, a, a bit of a, a vote of confidence from constituents on that. So on an election night, so talk me through what happens. You at 10 pm. You go from the polling station to the count. What happens at the count? Well, so, so actually, so that's a really interesting question. I mean, there are, there are, I've had two experiences. So 20, 2017, so my first election, um, I was, as I say, I was chapping doors up until about 10 to 10. Um, so I, I wasn't at the, I wasn't at the count for 10 o'clock. Um, I think it was my mum that came and picked me up, um, took me back to the house. They lived in Gara Hill at the time. I had to get a quick shower and get you know, like a suit and stuff like that because I've got this rule that I, I try to wear a suit as little as possible, particularly in the constituency, because um, I just don't feel particularly comfortable rocking about in a suit. I also hate wearing a rosette as well. The only time that I ever wear a rosette is at the count. I do not wear a rosette the whole way through the campaign. <laughs> Even in Poland Day, I'm just out in a, a, you know, a pair of jeans and a shirt and a jumper. Um, so Poland Day, um, Poland Day in 2017 was absolutely torrential rain. I think I had to change my clothes about three times because I just get drenched. But yeah, so at 10 o'clock, went back to my parents uh, in Garahill and uh, get, get showered in my suit. My, reset. my mum dropped me off at the, the Emirates Arena, which is where the count was. Um, and, you know, all these ballot boxes are being opened. We've got people doing what's called ballot box sampling. So you're looking at, you know, the results that are coming in. Um, and, you know, it was, it was quite clear that it was very, very close run. Um, I've got a really good friend of mine who's a member of the Irish Labour Party. His name's Conan O'Brien. Um, and he had come over from Dublin um, to help me. He used to be a special advisor, actually, in the Irish government. So he's a really kind of knowledgeable political guy. Um, in terms of policy, but also in terms of the campaign organisation and stuff. So he was over for the last week and he, I had him at the count with me and he was watching the ballot papers stack up and he said to me, I think, he says, I think you've got this by a whisker. Um, and it was, I mean, it's the whole kind of un, the, the untrained eye thing because to me it looked really, really close. I couldn't tell, but he says, I think there's just a sliver more ballot papers for you. Um so 2017, again, at that count, they, what they do is they give you what's called a provisional result. So they take you behind a little kind of curtain um, and they say, mm -hmm. you know, we've counted the ballot papers. Here are the rejected ballot papers, which are always quite funny. Um, I don't know if I can swear on this podcast. I'm going to take a liberty and just do it. But, yes, um, you can. You, go for it. Go you for get it. quite a lot of really funny things written in ballot papers. Um, people will draw very funny things. I'll leave it to the imagination of your listeners to think what kind of things they draw in ballot papers. Um, but some of the funniest ballot papers I've ever seen uh, in the boxes where people are meant to put their crosses, people write wank, wank, good guy, wank. Um, and it's really <laughs> funny because a lot of the time, uh, a lot of the time, uh, the candidate who has good guy in their box will say, that's a vote for me. Um, so we go through all the kind of rejected papers and then they say, look, you know, the result is, you know, uh, my, my, my opponent in the, the last two elections has been Kate Watson from the, from the, from the British Labour Party. Um, so Kate Watson, Labour Party candidate, X number of votes, David Linden, Scottish National Party. Um, and at that stage, it's up to the candidates and their election agents to say, right, OK, we accept the result. 
Um, and I was quite surprised, I've got to say, in 2017, because um, the result that they had given us was basically that I was 75 votes ahead. Now, I've always been taught and always been trained um, during campaigning, and particularly at election time, and bear in mind, I've been in election many times before, but the rule, the unwritten rule, has always been that if you get a provisional declaration, a provisional result, and there's less than 500 votes in it, you call for a recount because, you know, there could be straight mm-hmm. ballot papers in the wrong pile, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I think the big mistake uh, that my opponent had made, um, now I'm, I'm not questioning the, the legitimacy of the election in 2017, but I was surprised that my opponent and her election agent didn't call for a recount because 75 votes is hell of a close. Um, but That's I mean, very close, I, yeah. But my, my opponent had obviously, you know, like like me, she had put her heart and soul into the campaign. So she was obviously really upset to have come so close, but, you know, obviously, yeah, so far, because it was going to be me that was going off to Westminster on the Monday. Um, and I think the biggest mistake that was probably made that night, um, and certainly if I was in my opponent's shoes, I would have spent a lot of time wondering about this, was that her election agent was her mum. So obviously she's upset. And her mum, I think, probably went more into, understandably, went more into mum mode to kind of comfort her daughter rather than act as the election agent and look after her candidate and say, no, we want this to be recounted. So I was pretty shocked that my opponent didn't call for a recount. So anyway, they they take you up on the stage, they they read out the results um, and, uh, you know, the the video's online. Obviously, I'm, I'm delirious when the results announced my campaign team over the moon as well. In fact, everybody, frankly, in Glasgow said B was, was over the moon because I think we, it had either just been announced that we'd lost Glasgow North East or we knew in, informally that we'd lost Glasgow North East. So to win this seat and to win it by such a tight margin was like a real sigh of relief. So that, that was the count in 2017. Then in 2019, um, on Poland Day, I was a bit more relaxed. I, I kind of felt, I felt confident that we were going to hold the seat. Um, there was only really one point during the 2019 campaign where I thought, oh, gosh, this is really tight again. And it was the the Times had been doing some polling um, and they do some constituency modelling. Um, and so all the other seats in Glasgow, they had as kind of, you know, SNP hold, all that kind of stuff. But they had my seat as a toss up. Um, now, that, that didn't really kind of chime with what we were getting in the doorsteps. I mean, we had loads of folk. I mean, we, we couldn't print enough window posters we had people asking for windy posters we had folk who we never even knew were SNP supporters opening their window in the street and saying to us, oh I'm voting for you David or I'm voting for the SNP so you know we felt quite good about the election and then this time spoke him out suggesting the seat was a toss up and I just thought mm, maybe I'm missing something here um, but certainly by the last kind of four or five days of the campaign I felt relatively confident that we were going to hold the seat that we would maybe marginally increased the majority which is all you really need to do um so i, I was out on, on polling day and i think i think i, I probably chat doors until about nine back at nine um and it, it got to the stage jason where we were kind of chatting doors and a lot of our voters had come to the door and they said i've already been to vote i've either cast my, pro- my, my postal ballot for you um so the time we got to nine o'clock more people had voted than hadn't voted we weren't really having to kind of encourage folk out to vote people had already done it so um i kind of knocked off about nine o'clock again had to go and get kind of showered and shaved because I, I was i was rocking about again in a, a pair of jeans and a, a jumper i'd actually there was a photograph a really funny photograph um, from election day i was out in, in well house in my constituency and i had gone into the allotments to see some of the guys in the allotments and there's a photograph of me holding this chicken um so i think i had like chicken poo or something like that down, down my uh, this is a live chicken, by the way. Um, so I had chicken poo down, down my jumpers. I had to go get kind of showered and changed. And so I went to one of my uh, colleagues' uh, flats, um, one of the other Glasgow MPs, to watch the exit poll come in. And the exit poll came in and suggested the SNP was on to like, I don't know, like 50, 50 seats or something like that. So we were, we were clearly going to be up. Um, and based on that exit poll, my seat should have been okay. So we watched a bit of the exit poll, some of the early results coming in. I mean, the, the results across other parts of the UK were just horrifying because, um, you know, obviously the Tories were really on the march in the northeast of England. England they were winning seats like Blythe Valley, Bishop Auckland, you know, these really rock solid Labour seats were just calling the Tories. Um, so in some respects, you're sitting there, you're, you're quite just because, you know, the SNP is doing really well, um, but you're also facing the fact that 
you know, the Labour Party hadn't turned up to the races in England and were getting absolutely slaughtered in some of these red ball seats. And so there was this dawning realisation that not only was it going to be a Tory government, um, but it was going to be a majority Tory government that was going to ram through Brexit. Um, so I went to the count and, uh, yeah, I, mean, I was I've seen some of my own ballot box sampling. I mean, there were areas in my constituency where we were running away with, you know, 60, 70 percent of the vote according to the ballot box sampling. So that that's, you know, that's obviously really gratifying for us because the, the work that we put in these communities, people are coming out to vote for us. Um, but it was a bit of a bittersweet night um, because we'd done really well in Scotland where we're winning seats. I mean, like that. A good friend and colleague, Amy Callahan, had, had unseated Joe Swinson, the Lib Dem leader out in St. Bartonshire. So lots lots to celebrate, but equally I was conscious I was going back to Westminster on Monday with this huge Tory majority. Um, and it, it kind of makes that point that, you know, people in Scotland can vote against the Tories, whether it's for the Labour Party or whether it's for the SNP. But if people in majority numbers in England vote for the Tories, then you end up with a Tory government. Um, that's and, and that that's fundamentally why I believe in independence. I think that you know Scotland should get the government that votes for. But I don't want to get too political on this, so yeah, I'll leave it at that. No, you can't. You you are the MP. You can be political as you like. This is what it's for anyway. So then, as an MP, talk me through a standard week at Westminster in non-pandemic times. Well, actually, my kind of standard week at Westminster has been pretty much the same since uh, since the pandemic hit. Um, I've only, I think I've only missed about three or four weeks in London uh, since the pandemic struck. Um, obviously, I'm home at recess. That's that's why I'm, I'm home just now. Um, but I mean, normally, so it's, this is, is a, it's a Wednesday, I think. Uh, is it a Thursday? I think we're recording this on a Thursday. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, so I'm obviously home uh, today on a Thursday, but that's because it's recess. But I mean, my normal week tends to look a bit something like this. So I mean, normally my alarm goes off about half five on a Monday morning. Um, and I'll get up, get kind of showered, shaved, and I tend to kind of let the beard grow out a wee bit of the weekend when I'm not doing any kind of official engagements and stuff. So on Monday, I normally need to shave first thing on Monday morning, <laughs> um, get get some gear on, and then kind of have, have breakfast, and then head over to, to so I live in, I live in Carntine, um It's maybe about a five ten minute walk over to Carntine Station. Get the train from Carntine. Uh, into the city centre and then get the the train kind of crack it on uh, from Glasgow to London. Normally get into London, uh, Euston Station around about lunchtime into the House of Commons and quick catch up with my staff. So I've got a staffer based in, in Westminster and then the rest of my staff are based in, in Glasgow at Shettleston. Um, so quick kind of Teams call with all of them, looking ahead what's coming up that week, some of the debates I'm taking part in, some of the media things I might be doing. Um, what's happening in the constituency case part wise and then pretty much from half two until 10 o'clock there's just a full on parliamentary day so there's debates there's question sessions um, different meetings or party group meetings and stuff and then on Monday night we normally finish roughly about 10 half 10 at night um, so Mondays are you know, you're pretty knackered on a Monday night by the end of it maybe you're up since half five in the morning and then you're still voting sometimes mm-hmm. at 10 11 o'clock on a Monday night Um then Tuesday, um, normally into the office, sometime around half eight, nine o'clock uh, at Westminster. First couple of hours will be um, meetings with different organisations, maybe constituents who've come to London, giving them tours and stuff like that. Uh, and then half eleven is when the stuff in the chamber all kicks off again. So yeah, it's kind of parliamentary day again. It's questions, sessions, debates. That goes on until about seven o'clock. Then we vote at seven o'clock. Uh, on a Tuesday night, and then you know, I don't want I don't want to kind of paint a picture of it, about it being all work. By the way, I'm on a Tuesday night, pretty religiously, I meet up with four other MPs. Um, so obviously, at the moment, we're doing it virtually because of, because of the pandemic. But certainly pre-pandemic, um, I would meet up on a, a Tuesday night with four other colleagues um, who are SNP MPs who call ourselves the Tuesday Club. Um, and we'll go for a few pints, um, just as as anybody does. Um, so we'll go for a few pints on a, a Tuesday night. Wednesday's pretty much a repeat of Tuesday, um, except the Tuesday club, and we don't do that on Wednesday night. Um, so again, kind of half 11 in the morning, um, through until about 7 o'clock at night. I try, I try and take it kind of Wednesday night. Um, when, by the time I get back to my flat, at kind of half 7, 8 o'clock, um, maybe cook some dinner, watch a film or something like that. And then Thursday um, in Parliament from about half 9, where Parliament sits a bit earlier on a Thursday morning, and then finish at 5. And get the train back up to Glasgow uh, on a, a Thursday night. Normally, get in about midnight uh, is when I get back to my flat. 
And then Friday, Friday's my favourite day. It's just full on. Um, so Carol Ann, who, who works in my office, she kind of plans a diary and stuff like that. But she says a Friday's a bit like a tornado because I just come into the constituency office and call it chaos, um, like changing lots <laughs> of stuff. And um, so I'll, I'll go out and do quite a lot of visits. I, I don't tend to, to sit and do emails or anything like that. I mean, a Friday would normally be about seven or eight visits. So schools, businesses, um, surgeries, all that kind of stuff. So really kind of out and about quite a lot today. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so it, it's quite full on. But I mean, the, the, the staff in the office go nuts because, you know, I'm a bit like, some offices in Shetland Road, so I'm a bit go out at lunchtime to go and get a, a rolling sausage or something like that. And I'll bump into somebody in the street who will say to me, oh, I've got a problem with, you know, whether it's, you know, their car insurance or their, their benefit claim or something like that. And I'll come back with the details of this constituency case written in the back of a, a kind of packet for a rolling sausage or something like this, this like greasy packet, all these constituency <laughs> details. But I mean, that's the part of my job I really like. It's, you know, that you're in your community, that people, I mean, I think it's really important that people feel that, you know, recently I was, I was in the approach. Yeah, so I, I mean, I went to Tesco in Shettleston to go and get a new light bulb from my living room. And, you know, in the space of me going to get a light bulb, like two or three people stopped me. And some people are stopping me to ask about what Brexit or COVID or that kind of thing. Um, but I think, I think that's really good. Um, but I think that kind of stuff drives the staff in the office a bit nuts when I come back to like, you know, the details of a, you know, a pothole or a street light that's broken written in the back of a receipt. <laughs> um, so you're going for a own sausage and coming back and they've got more workload? Yeah, exactly. So I can see from their point of view why they're getting a raw deal out of this. I'm coming back to my lunch and they're coming back back and in the case. But there we go. Um, but that that's kind of, so that's what a standard kind of Monday to Friday looks like. Um, I've obviously I've got two very young children, so my, my son's five, my daughter's two. So I try as much as possible to to keep kind of Saturdays and Sundays um, restricted to kind of doing family, fa- time. family time. Um, so taking them to the park and stuff like that. Um, I'm also I'm a for my sins clearly in a previous life I'm a season ticket holder at Airdrie Unions. So kind of downtime, certainly mm-hmm. two two weeks, uh, two Saturdays in a month, I would be over at New Broomfield on the Jack Dale stand cheering on my team uh, with my son. Um, but yeah, I'm a, every maybe five or six weeks, pre-pandemic, every five or six weeks, kind of I would do like a kind of Saturday half day. So like go do the park run in the morning, uh, then do a supermarket surgery, then a coffee morning and stuff like that. But I'll be honest and say that I do try and keep weekends as, as free as possible. Certainly in the evenings, you know, at night, once the kids are asleep. I've been back on the laptop doing emails and stuff like that. But but Saturday, Sunday day time, um, I, I try and keep to be kind of family, family time. time. Obviously, I go to church as well. So I'm, uh, I worship at Parkhead Nazarene Church. So certainly every Sunday morning, I'm at church. But, um, you know, it's, it's a really busy church. Um, but the, the rest of the fellow parishioners and stuff at the church are really respectful of the fact that I'm there not as an MP, but I'm there as another Christian. So people are really good at giving me a bit of space. They don't, they, you know, they won't come up to me and start talking to me about work. In fact, they're really supportive. More often than not, they'll come up to me and say, oh, that was, you know, it was really hard going at work this week. Uh, but I mean, particularly during the Brexit stuff, actually, you know, they were really good because the, the Brexit stuff was a really kind of fragile atmosphere. Um, by, by virtue of being a politician, you know, you get quite a lot of abuse at times as well, particularly on social media. Um, but it's really nice. And there's a couple of old ladies in particular who, just kind of like really mother me quite a lot um, and they'll, they'll come up to me and say oh I, I see that you get a bit of abuse on Facebook this week uh, just let know we're praying for you and actually that's really nice it's really sweet that they, they kind of feel the the ability to come up and, and kind of be supportive they, they don't see me as being the local MP they see me as David who sits along the other end of the rope from them at church on a Sunday morning um, so I mean that that's quite a big part of my life um, I've obviously struggled a bit more during the pandemic because obviously the church building shut me now and we're doing all our services on Facebook uh, and Zoom and things like that. But um, yeah, I mean, a Sunday morning, pretty religiously, I would be at church on a Sunday morning. Um, and that, that, that's, a, that's a kind of fairly standard week for me. Um, I say a fairly standard week. I mean, it, it, no week's ever the same in Westminster. I mean, some weeks you're standing up, you're questioning the Prime Minister. But um, yeah, that, that's what a normal week looks like. Looking ahead then to the 2021 Scottish Parliament election, and obviously we're, you, you would be supporting um, SNP to be re-elected. What parts of the SNP's record on governance do you feel are strongest? Well, I think so. I mean, I think there's a hell of a lot that we've got to be proud of. I mean, it's, it's almost unheard of to have you know, 
party in government for 14 years. I mean, even this morning, just literally before we recorded this on, on Thursday uh, lunchtime, you know, there was a poll out this morning showing us on 53% the constituency poll. And I think some of that is because, you know, we have invested uh, quite a lot in society. So we've got things like free prescriptions, we've got free uh, tuition at university. So, you know, young folk don't perhaps have to make the same decisions that, that I had to make in 2006. I mean, in 2006, we still had the graduate endowment fee, so there was essentially a tax on education. Um, so there's stuff like that. Even more recently, we've, we've invested in things like the baby box, um, which, which means that you know people in people in Scotland, when you're born, every child, whether you're born to a really middle-class family or whether you're born to a family similar to, to what mine was in 1990, you know, the government treats you equally, you get all this support. We've got things like the Scottish Child Payment, what's called a, charities themselves have described that as being a, a game-changing £10 a week for, for, for children in Scotland. That's the SNP's committed to doubling that to £20 a week. Um, so th there's a lot of really good policies and things that we've done um, in the last 14 years. Um, and I think that, you know, we certainly if we stand on our record. I think that, that support for the SNP for our domestic record is actually pretty good. Other things that we could do better, absolutely. Um, I, I'm not naive enough to think that. Um, but what we're asking folks to do is to endorse the SNP's record for the last 14 years of this election and give us another five years. Um, some of that is based on our handling of the pandemic. I think that you know Nicola Sturgeon has, has levelled with quite a lot of people during the pandemic. Um, have we got things wrong? Absolutely. I think the public inquiry will say that there are things that we could have done better. But you know, nobody changes for how to deal with a global pandemic. But I, I was talking to my neighbour next door just, just last night and, and you know she was saying that she just feels there's a massive difference between Boris Johnson and Nicola Sturgeon, that Nicola Sturgeon's been doing these daily press briefings, trying to communicate to folk the decisions that the government's taken. Not all those decisions are, are going to be popular, obviously, um, but I think people feel that in Nicola Sturgeon and the SNP government, that you know we're trying to level with them, we're trying to be honest with them about what the challenges are. Um, and certainly the polling that, that that's that shown at the moment is that you know we should be returned as the government. But crucially, you know, we've also got you know a number of asks to the public, you know, about what we want to deliver at the election. So we are crystal clear that we want decisions about Scotland's future made in Scotland. We don't want decisions about Scotland made by bungling Brexit supporting Boris Johnson. Um and so at this election, you know, if you want Scotland's future to be in Scotland's hands, not Boris Johnson's, then it's got to be both votes SNP and the sixth of May. And that's the, the message that I am repeating ad nauseum uh, in every community when I go to leaflet and then when I speak to people. Then the looking at the manifesto with the new policies, which new policies do you think are most important to people, especially in the east end of Glasgow? One of the biggest issues that people come to me about, Jason, is is just not being able to get on the housing uh, not not necessarily on the housing ladder, but actually to get into social housing. Um, there was a, a yeah. reckless policy pursued by Margaret Thatcher's Conservative government in the late 80s, early 90s, um, of what's called right to buy. So basically all these council houses were sold off. And so the amount of social housing that we had um, was appalling. And even in Scotland, frankly, when, when housing was devolved to the Scottish government, I mean, the Labour government from 1999 to 2007 built a grand total of six council houses. Um, so I'm really keen on making sure that we've got a lot more social housing. So you know we've, we've done an awful lot in terms of building social housing, but the, one of the, the big commitments that's already been released ahead of the manifesto is a commitment that over the next decade to build 100,000 houses in Scotland, 70% of which will be for social rent. Now, if even a fraction mm -hmm. of them come east end of Glasgow, that will reduce waiting lists um, for a lot of my housing associations. So I think that's a massive, massive policy. There's other things as well, like making sure that we issue every child with a laptop. Um, digital exclusion is a massive, massive problem in my constituency. And so, yeah, during the pandemic, mm -hmm. we've tried to get iPads and stuff out to folks who've been doing home learning. But we know that, that education can be so much more enriched if people have digital access. So the fact that the government's committed to issuing every child with a laptop or tablet, um, I think is something that, that is hugely important. But all those things are only going to be delivered if we can be like an SNP government. Do you think that the both votes SNP is almost a wasted vote on the second vote? Um, no, I, I kind of take issue with your what you're saying a wee bit there. Um, so that there are two examples. I mean, you're right. Twenty sixteen, you know, we felt we, we had a majority, and in twenty sixteen, we lost a majority. 
um, because uh, not everybody followed through and they both vote SNP. So 20, 2011, which I mean, so some people, particularly this, this new Alaba party led by Alex Salmon, like to say, oh, you know, that, you know, by voting both votes SNP, that somehow that's a wasted vote. Um, that's a bit of a surprise because I remember campaigning for and with Alex Salmon in 2011 when he was first minister and he was telling people to do both votes SNP. And actually, that's a good point. Uh, and, and, you know, in, in 2011, um, we did actually get a majority and we were winning regional seats in areas where we'd won constituencies, most notably, for example, in the northeast of Scotland. So, I mean, there's, there's polling out only this morning that suggests that actually the thing that could deprive the SNP of its majority would be people wasting their second vote on other parties, whether that's the Alaba Party or the Greens or any other kind of small fringe parties that have stood up. Um, so I, I would argue that the precedent from 2011 shows that if you do both vote for SNP, you can get that majority SNP government. And it's only, a, it's only a majority SNP government that is going to send a message to Westminster that they've got to go back and give us a second referendum because, you know, I, I think that, that that's the test that, that, that Westminster's going to set for this. So, um, you know, the, the poll this morning, I think, had the Alaba party on like 2% or something like that. So if that, if that translated, then it would be Alex Salmond's Alaba party that would deny the SNP a majority government. Um, I think it'd be a huge irony, a very cruel irony, certainly for us in that. And so that's why my message to, to SNP members, to constituents, is very much to use both their votes for the SNP. Don't gamble. The final thing I would say on this, Jason, is as well, is that this is a hell of a um, presumptuous, it's, it's hell of ignorant um, to, to say, oh, well, you can use your you can use your second vote for another party because the SNP are going to host the constituencies. My own example in 2017 shows that, you know, sometimes constituency results can be a hell of a lot closer than you thought. Um, so we are taking nothing for granted. That's why we're saying to folk, don't gamble with your votes. Do your constituency vote for the SNP and do your regional vote for the SNP as well. And you know, if, we, if we can get enough votes in the, the regional list, we all get regional seats as well. Um, so there's a, there's a degree of misinformation coming about, but perhaps that's not surprising for for a man who who's now on the pay of the Russian state. I, th- I think it was very opportunistic that he transitioned from the inquiry right on to launching a new party. What's your opinion on it? I mean, I've got lots of opinions, but I'm also kind of of the view <laughs> that, you know, people only talk about Alex Salmon if, you know, Alex Salmon only gets attention if people are kind of talking about him. And I, I don't want to give the guy airtime because, um, you know, even by his own admission, he, he, he's, he's done things that, are just you know unacceptable. His, his behaviour, I think, by his own admission, mm-hmm. has fallen short. Um, so I, I think that for for some of the women who have courageously come forward and made complaints about his behaviour, um, it must be pretty traumatic for them to to see him come through the inquiry um, and then just kind of like move on as if nothing has happened. Um, so I think my yeah, absolutely. I think my my biggest concern is the impact on some of the complainants um, who have suggested that some of his behaviour was inappropriate, and he's now he's now seeking to run for public office. And now I would I would probably concur with Nicola Sturgeon, the first minister, in, in question whether or not Alex Salmon does is fit to run for public office. But that's that's a question for that's a question I guess for Alex Salmon. But for me. My kind of priority is, is just getting out of there, getting my three local MSPs re-elected, getting Nicola Sturgeon returned as First Minister and getting on with the, the campaign. And any of this other stuff is a, a distraction, but a very distasteful distraction, I would say. Right, so just a couple of non-politics, more fun type questions to finish off. What's been your highlight of supporting Airdrie Onans in your lifetime? Ah, well, that's a really good question. Um I mean, certainly for the 19 years that I've been following the Airdrie, it's been pretty grim. Um, I think we've been in the current league that we're in for about 11 years. Um, I've seen us win, well, I've actually seen us only lift one trophy. Um, I've been at a cup final where um, it went into extra time and penalties, and um, I was working for a Westminster MP at the time, and so I had to get to London. So I had to listen to the rest of the game on extra time and penalties on the radio on the way to the airport. Um, so I've seen as uh, in my time supporting Airdrie, you know, we've won two cups. Obviously, one of them was a league, and one of them was a cup. Um, but it's been pretty grim. But actually, my highlight is uh, it's 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 not so much of a secret anymore because I think I, I've spoken about it in a magazine interview before. But um, my chat up line uh, to, to girls when I was a teenager 
uh, was to tell them <laughs> that, you know, on a Saturday afternoon, I run out the tunnel in a 10,000 seater stadium to dazzle and entertain fans with my skills. And I think sometimes you used to think I was a footballer, but I wasn't. I was actually a football mascot. I was the I was the Airdrie mascot for a couple of years. <laughs> Um, so I dressed up as this big like eight foot chicken, but it's actually a rooster, but most people call that chicken. Um, so yeah, I mean that that was really good fun. Um, so I, I was uh, a teenager at the time, so I was there to mascot. Um, but for me, I mean, su- supporting the diamonds is uh, it's a, a labour of love a lot of the time. Um, but somebody's got to support the ready teams, and there's lots about it that I really enjoy, Jason. I mean, like, but we've also got a really distinctive strip. I'm a I'm an avid collector. Of, of old Airdrie tops. So I've got 40, 40 Airdrie tops um, going back as far as the 1970s. Um, and yeah, I love the strip. Obviously, it's the very kind of distinctive, what, what folk think is a V, but actually, if you lie it flat, it's, it's a diamond. Um, I like the community feeling of it as well. I mean, Airdrie's got a very small support. You know, at most, there's probably only about six, seven, eight hundred fans. So we all know each other quite well. Um, and I really like the fact that when I go into get my pie at the concourse and the Jack Dale stand. There's a lot of people that you know I quite like that kind of really kind of close-knit, intimate community feeling in the club. Um, and arguably, you, you probably don't get that if you support you know, Rangers or Celtic because you go to Dybrox or Parkhead and there's 50, 60,000 other people there and you won't know them. Whereas yeah. at Airdrie, you know, I, I've been going on the same supporters bus for, for 15 years. I know all the guys on that. Um, so it, it's, it's nice. And I also quite like the fact that you genuinely you, you go into a game and you do not know whether you're going to win or lose. I mean, most Rangers are Celtic fans go head along to Celtic Park or Ibrox and they know they're going to win. It's just a case of by how many. Whereas I genuinely, I mean, I watched I watched my team on Tuesday night play Falkirk Road leaders and did not know what the result was going to be. And you know, we, we won two one uh, with a goal in the last ten minutes, and so it keeps you in your toes a wee bit. But it's you know, we're not a great team. Um, we are, are kind of a, a pretty <laughs> average mid-table second division club um, but it keeps life interesting um, and I think it's important that when you do the job that I do as well that you've got other interests and so supporting the Airdrie um, at times can be incredibly painful but it's, it's something that fundamentally I enjoy and I'm, I'm obviously I'm, I'm roping my son and, and all my, do- my daughter as well and to support the Airdrie and Isaac's got a season ticket and comes along with me so I'm, I'm passing on the baton to him to experience the misery as well Next one then, as soon as the restrictions end, so say day one of no restrictions, where's the first place you and the family are going? Um, well, I mean, obviously the restrictions are being lifted on a kind of gradual basis. So the, the Piece by piece. One that I'm looking forward to is taking the kids to Clyde Valley, which is um, out kind of Lanark way. Um, so we've got these little kind of season passes. So it's like a kind of like kind of farm park and... It's got like a kind of like model train and, and stuff like that as well. Uh, lots of different rides and stuff. So I'm a big fan of going there, but obviously the, the current travel restrictions mean I can't leave Glasgow unless it's for work. So obviously I'm going back and forward to London, but I can't actually go into Lanarkshire. Um, so th- there's a kind of cruel irony that even if, and it wouldn't happen, but even if uh, fans were allowed back into to, uh, the recent New Broomfield Stadium, if travel restrictions were in place, I wouldn't be able because I live in Glasgow. Um, so I'm quite looking forward to some of those local travel restrictions being lifted um, and being able to go back to Airdrie to Stadium and, and watching a game in person because um, I hate watching it live stream um, and also getting to things like Clyde Valley um, and simple things like, you know, taking the, the car for a run down to Trun and getting a first supper and stuff like that. So I think it's, it's wee simple things like that, Jason, that I'm looking forward to. I'm not one of these folk who's desperate for restrictions to lift so I can jet off to, to Ibiza or Benidorm or something like that. I, I think the pandemic <laughs> has taught us all that actually some of the things that we miss most in life are the simple things. Um, so one of the things I've really enjoyed the last kind of week or so has been able to go out in my parents' back garden and sit and have dinner with them out in the back garden. I mean, that seems like such a simple thing, but we've gone months and been able to do it. So I think I think we take a lot of our more basic freedoms. Uh, we, we took a lot of them um, for granted, whereas now post pandemic, I think simple things like being able to take a run down to Turin for a fish up on a Friday night will be a real treat. And finally, what is your most optimistic hopes for Scotland at the upcoming Euros? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, I, I, I think you know if we can go 
you put absolutely everything into it, don't embarrass ourselves. I mean, obviously, everybody's got that that date of the 16th of June at Wembley in their heads. Um, you know, if restrictions yeah. allow, I, I'm hoping to be in London for it. I, I don't think I'll get a ticket for Wembley, um, but I'm hoping to go watch it in one of the pubs in London with some of the pals uh, to be there and soak up some of the atmosphere. And um, I, I don't think, you know, a lot of us think that we've, we've got a chance to go on to actually win Euros, but, you know, if we're able to get the group stages, I think that'd be great. I mean, bear in mind, I was born in 1990. The last time that I saw Scotland in a competitive uh, tournament was in 1998. Um, so, you know, this is going to be a massive thing for us, watching Scotland play, um, you know, in the Euros. So, yeah, I think the most optimistic thing would be don't get embarrassed when we play England. I mean, you know, if we can beat them, I think that would be great. Um, but, you know, if, if we could get out of the group stages, uh, that, that'd, be, that'd be brilliant. Super. So, just for the listeners, then, can you want? Do you want to plug your socials? Where can people find you? Get in touch with you? Yeah. Um. So I'm on uh, Facebook. You can find me as David Linden MP on Facebook, on Twitter as well. Um. To be honest, Facebook and Twitter it's a combination of certainly Facebook, maybe a bit more local. Twitter's really boring. It's just me talking about politics all the time. But the place to find me, if you want to get a genuine kind of flavour of kind of combination of politics and life, is Instagram. Hey, I really, really enjoy Instagram. And also do a podcast myself as well. Um, so I've got a podcast called East End Years, which can be found on all the major platforms. I do that every week, and that's a wee roundup of Westminster. So please uh, give me a follow. Um, and most importantly, if you see me going to Tesco for light bulbs, come up and tell me your problems, because that's what everybody else does. Then the people will say on the spoil ballots that you're the good guy. Well, that's that's if I ever stand for election again. I've not decided whether or not I want to stand for election again, but we'll see, we'll see. Um, but yeah, if, if, if I'm in a ballot paper, please don't bite wine next to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, no, that's me. Thank you so much for your time. Brilliant, thoroughly enjoyed it, Jason. Thanks very much for having me on. I really appreciate it, and I'll, I'm sure you'll you'll send over the link to me when it when it comes live, and we'll put it out on all the social feeds and stuff like that. And there you have it. A massive thanks to David for his time and dedication for putting across his pitch for the SNP vote at the election. David can be found on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. The links to all these are in the show notes. Please check him out. As I mentioned before, there is another election special with Councillor Philip Charles of the Scottish Conservatives. I felt it would be important to have a unionist voice on the podcast too, so please have a listen to that. You can support the podcast by subscribing wherever you get your podcasts. If you can, please leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. I know I talk about this constantly, but it does really help with the visibility. But to finish off, as always, I am your host Jason. Thank you very much for listening to this SMP election special episode of the Lost for Words podcast.